Well, good evening, everyone. Um, if you have that passage open uh, in your Bibles or on your devices, can I just ask you to keep it open because we're going to keep looking at it um, closely. <clears throat> have you ever thought about uh, how many voices you hear each and every day? Now, I don't mean the kind of white noise of a bustling cafe, nor do I just mean the voices in your home or your office or your classroom. I mean the voices of companies and marketing teams who fill our city with billboards. You'll see about 5,000 ads a day on average. I mean the voices uh, of the five or so Netflix shows you've got on the go. I mean the voices of newscasters and journos, of authors and of the artists that you love to fill your ears with. And I mean the voices of uh, hundreds of podcast hosts trying to conquer the world one true crime story at a time. I recently got an ad for this app called Calm. You might have got the same. I feel like it's a sign. Anyway, um, it's a meditation and sleep app where you can listen to celebrities with particularly soothing voices tell you stories to help you fall asleep. Even as we go to sleep, Companies want to put voices in our ears. So if you're anything like me, there are voices in your head from dawn to dusk. And in many ways, it's a great privilege, isn't it, to have so many voices to a diversity of kind of perspectives on the world, if you're willing to engage with those perspectives. To hear the voices of people who are different to us, it's a beautiful thing. It can encourage great empathy and love and unity. But uh, having so many voices in our ears can also be overwhelming, debilitating even. What should I think about this issue? What's the truth about this conflict or this person? Voice after voice will tell you that they have the answer to that. Or they'll just raise more problems that you probably don't have solutions for. It feels uh, a little on the nose that I'm saying this to you right now as you listen to my voice. Because the voices we listen to, consciously or subconsciously, have great power to influence us, to shape how we think about the world, perhaps more than we recognize. So how do you work out which voice to listen to? Which voices should actually influence your thinking, your life decisions, your faith? Whether you'd call yourself a Christian or not, Jesus is another voice in the crowd. And he might be saying big things about the world and about meaning and about life, but so are lots of other voices. So why is Jesus' voice worth listening to? Maybe you think it is, but why? What reason do you have to listen to Jesus' voice over every other voice? And if the answer in your head right now is something like, well, because Jesus saved me, so I should listen to him. I actually think there's more to it than that. And in our passage today, that, that's the exact question that's addressed. Why listen to Jesus' voice? And two Johns, John the Baptist and John the author of this book, are going to help us to think through why Jesus' voice is worth listening to more than any other. Because where we come to in the story, there seem to be conflicting voices in first century Judea, and people aren't quite sure what to do about it, who to listen to. Sound familiar? So, let's jump into the passage and let's see what's happening. First up, we have seemingly two voices in conflict. In our first little paragraph, verses 22 to 24, we seem to have this battle of the baptisms set up. You see, over in one part of Judea, Jesus is baptizing with his disciples, which we later find out in chapter 4 means he's overseeing his disciples as they perform water baptisms. And in another part of town, John the Baptist is doing the same thing. He's baptizing people, it's in his name, and this time it's about 80 k's from Jesus. 
at Aenon near Salim. Why is he there? Well, apparently the water was really nice. Plentiful. So some people were going to John the Baptist and some people were going to Jesus, which means we have a problem. Has Jesus started some kind of rival baptism business, some kind of competing ministry close by? They say competition's good for business, but not when it comes to being made right with God. And some of John the Baptist's followers, they're not too happy. Look down at verse 25. A discussion arose. That's very British. No fights, only discussions. And this discussion between John, John's followers and a Jew, it's about the issue of purification. We don't find out exactly what they were discussing, but perhaps it's linked to where true purification for sins is found, with John the Baptist or with Jesus and his new band of Baptists in the countryside. John's followers approach John the Baptist with a resentful and actually an untrue observation in verse 26. They say, Rabbi, which means teacher, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. Hey, John, this guy, Jesus, seems like he's uh, getting a real following over there. Everyone is going to see him now, which we know from the passage is not true. Lots of people are still coming to John. But what do you have to say for yourself, John? What are you going to do? It looks like your business is under threat. And you can understand their point of view at this point. These guys are die-hard John the Baptist fans. They don't want to see their fearless leader fall off the radar because someone who John made famous was now a more prominent voice in the community. They're clearly pretty jealous. And given that they're both baptizing, is Jesus now saying that his baptism is legit? and more valid than John's. Whose voice is the right one to listen to at this point? So we have what seems like two conflicting voices, both saying, perhaps, that purification is found through only them. So John's followers want to know what to do, and ironically, we've not heard either voice yet. So we come to our first voice, John the Baptist. What does John say in response? Well, he starts by talking about heaven, In verse 27, he says, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. What seems like a cryptic response here is actually genius. Because John's trying to show them that they've completely misunderstood the situation. There is no conflict between the voices. And John's answer, it starts with a big statement about God being in control of all things and all things are given to us by Him. And therefore, John wants to say, my role and voice that I have in Judea as John the Baptist, it's given by God too. And his role is very specific. He says that he's not the Christ, he's the one sent to prepare us for the Christ. We heard about that already in chapter 1, but John just wants to make it crystal clear. So, John's followers, they're worried about the kind of immediate longevity of John's ministry and work, of his popularity, but John couldn't care less about that. He knows the role and the place of his voice. It's to prepare people for the voice to come, the Saviour of the world. And so, actually, this explains why John's response is so strangely positive in comparison to his followers. John's followers have noticed that Jesus' ministry is taking off, that his popularity is growing. So, John's over the moon. He knows the role of his voice, and he's seen how God's used it to prepare the way for Jesus. It's a beautiful picture of humility. And he uses this great wedding analogy, right, to demonstrate his excitement to his followers. And this analogy, it's rich with symbolism from the Old Testament. So look down at verse 29. He says, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly 
at the bridegroom's voice. John sees his role as the best man at a wedding, the one who makes the groom look good and who rejoices at the groom's voice. John is delighted that Jesus' voice is being heard. But there's more to it than that. You see, in the Old Testament, God is often described as a bridegroom and his people as like a bride in a number of places, including in our second reading. So John rejoices because the wedding day is at hand. The bride, God's people, will finally be united to God, the bridegroom. And John gets to rejoice because his role as the best man is complete. He rejoices as he hears the very voice of God. Last weekend, I had the great privilege of watching Harrison and Emma get married from our night church congregation. Many of you would know them. Riley Irwin, who's sitting here with us, was Harrison's best man. And uh, he gave one of the better best men speeches that I've ever heard, actually. It was fantastic. And at the beginning of Riley's speech, this is what he said. He said, what I'm here to do today in this speech is to convince you that Emma has made the right choice in picking Harrison. And then I'm going to sit down. And that's exactly what Riley did. He, as the best man, had made me confident that the bride was marrying the right person. And so when we heard Harrison get up and speak, we were delighted and we were confident, rejoicing in the marriage. And that's exactly what John the Baptist has done so far in this story. He's prepared and convinced people that Jesus is the right person to follow. So now, he can resume his position beside the bridegroom, and rejoice at the bridegroom's voice. His voice has done its job. People are listening to Jesus. And so he says, therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. The response that John's followers thought they were going to get had been turned on its head. They were disappointed and resentful and questioning, but John the Baptist, he's rejoicing. Oh, you heard Jesus' voice. You heard of his work. Good. I'm so thankful. What a privilege. Listen to him. And so he finishes with those famous words, he must increase, but I must decrease. And appropriately, these are the last words of John the Baptist in this gospel account. His voice is faded from the story. The voice that was once crying out in the wilderness has fulfilled its purpose. So now, we must turn to the voice of the bridegroom. And this is where John, the author, steps in. You see, he wants to give us the full spectrum of Jesus' voice, the reason that we should listen to him. It's as if John the Baptist has given us kind of one layer of sound, one layer of the voice, but now... John, the author, steps in to provide the harmony lines, the layers of sound that are going to help us to hear the bridegroom's voice in all his glory. And John starts with the voice's origin in verse 31. He says, there are two kinds of people, two kinds of voices, one whose voice comes from heaven versus one whose voice comes from earth. The earthly person speaks in an earthly way, but the heavenly person the heavenly person is above all and bears witness not just to earthly things, but to heavenly realities. Here we have the key difference between all of our voices and the voice of Jesus. All of our voices, all the things that we speak of are earthly. But Jesus' voice is different because Jesus is from heaven he is above all things. And therefore, he speaks of realities that aren't just in the here and now. Jesus has a heavenly perspective and speaks to us of it on earth. But that poses a problem in verse 32. Earthly people, they won't naturally receive Jesus' voice. Our inclination is to ignore it, to block it out. 
to tune in to more concrete things. Uh, a few years ago, there was this um, funny video that went around where someone said a word. Uh, now, I'm going to play that video for you. You might recognize it. The word you're hearing. Laurel. 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 All right, great. That's enough. Um, some of you would have heard the word laurel. Others of you would have heard yani. Technically, both sounds are in that clip. But because of the frequency of the two different sounds, your ear is only going to hear one. So in order for you to hear the other word, you actually would need to be able to tune your ear to a different frequency, which you cannot do without someone helping you. In our world, no one can choose which frequency to tune into between heavenly and earthly voices. Our natural frequency is to hear and think about what earthly voices are saying. Voices about mortgages and school enrollments and high distinctions and promotions, about our next party, our next date, our next holiday, our next car, our next coffee even. We're so attuned to those voices and they want us to forget that there might be another frequency. There might be another voice that speaks from a heavenly place into our existence. But we can't hear the frequency of heaven until we listen to the voice of Jesus. He testifies not just to earthly things, but he's come from heaven, so his voice speaks of greater realities than just our earthly existence. So it makes sense that whoever does listen to and receive Jesus' voice, in verse 33, stakes their claim, sets their seal that God is true. But how do we know that Jesus is God's distinct voice on earth. Well, John tells us in verse 34, For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Jesus is the very voice of God on earth, speaking God's words, because he's been given God's Spirit without measure. See, in the Old Testament, prophets would have the Spirit of God fall on them for a period of time, and in that period, they would speak of heavenly realities that God's people needed to hear in that moment. They would act as God's mouthpiece on earth. But Jesus, Jesus is different. He has the Spirit without measure, we saw in John chapter 1 that God's Spirit descended onto Jesus and it's permanently remained in Him. So that means that every single word, every syllable, every phrase uttered by Jesus is a word from God. Everything Jesus says is worth listening to. John, the author, he takes... John the Baptist's analogy about Jesus' voice, and he fills it out. It swells to this great crescendo as we see that Jesus isn't just any other voice. He's the Spirit-filled voice of God on earth. He speaks God's truth into a world that's only interested in defining earthly truth. And he's been speaking to all of us on every page of the book of the Bible. And if you've got your Bibles open or your devices open, note the next person that Jesus speaks to in John's Gospel. And note, if you have some time later, what Jesus' heavenly voice does to shape her understanding and experience of the world and of God and of satisfaction. Jesus' voice in that passage is for the powerless and the shamed, for the demeaned, and for those who are seeking satisfaction in earthly things but failing to find it. 
So actually, Jesus' voice is for all of us. So to trust in Jesus' voice is to trust in the very Word of God. In a world filled with a cacophony of blaring voices, Jesus' is genuinely unique. He's speaking the words of the true and living God. So, where does Jesus' voice rank amongst the other voices in your life? I was um, greatly struck reflecting this week on this passage that I'm so quick to listen to other voices in my life when I want reassurance or security, a nice word from someone or an escapist film or just an album that picks me up in a rut. And you know, it's not that those things are bad things. But if Jesus is the one true voice of God, His words should be the ones I'm listening to and looking to, to find guidance and security and wisdom, and ultimately, salvation. His voice should sit above every other voice in my life. And if you're overwhelmed by the number of voices that you hear, and that's completely understandable, hear the comfort that comes in this passage from John the Baptist and John the author, as they say, here is the one voice worth listening to. The great news is Jesus isn't offering a list of instructions or a moral code or a life of restriction. Jesus offers you true life, now and forever. Look down there at verse 36. It says, whoever believes in the Son, that's Jesus, has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Listen and trust in the voice of God and have eternal life. Ignore God's voice and receive the just punishment for shutting him out. God's voice is worth listening to. This isn't some kind of trivial matter. This is life or death. So if you haven't taken the time to listen to Jesus' voice, please do. Please see that to avoid Jesus' voice is to avoid the voice of God calling to you, offering you true life. Without that voice, our only choice is to face God's wrath. So please, keep reading John's Gospel with us. Keep listening to Jesus' voice. Keep hearing who He says He is and what He offers us. A few weeks back, uh, we sang the song, Jesus Strong and Kind. I think it's my new favourite. And the reason that I love that song so much uh, is because its incredible, incredibly simple lyrics speak of profound truths about Jesus' voice. Each verse begins, Jesus said. So let's listen to what Jesus says. Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to Him. Jesus said that if I'm weak, I should come to Him. Jesus said that if I fear, I should come to Him. And most significantly, Jesus said, if I am lost, He will come to me. The very voice of God is offering you satisfaction and strength and security and most of all, eternal life with God. Of all the voices in our world, God's voice sounds like one worth listening to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice as we hear the voice of Jesus. Would you help us to continue listening to his voice as he offers life and salvation and hope for all who believe in him? Lord, most of all, we thank you that Jesus said if we're lost, he will come to us. And we're all lost without Jesus. So we praise you for his wonderful work on the cross to bring us home. In his great name we pray and we rejoice. Amen.
Guys, I'm just going to give you a minute.